What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Oh, precious Father, God in heaven, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy, Father. Thank you for loving us enough that you would send your only begotten Son to die for us. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for being our God, Father. We thank you that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior to the glory of you, Father. Father, we thank you for your people who yearn to be more like Jesus. We thank you for your people who yearn to do your will and not their will. We thank you for your senior saints who have helped to lead us and guide us in your direction, Father, in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the message today. We thank you. Satan, you have to get out of here now because there's no room for you because of God's majestic presence. In Jesus' name, flee, Satan. In the name of Jesus, in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for thy sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Sometimes remembering is sad or bitter, isn't it? It would be easier to drift in a nostalgic haze, avoiding some of the painful aspects of the past, wouldn't it? But even melancholy thoughts are essential, aren't they? An older person may come to grips with his losses and failures and then come to grips with the larger fact of God's power, his understanding, and his forgiveness. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? 
who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? An older person considering his past will certainly find reason for regret. Yet this exploration should carry him beyond regret to the point of saying with Christ, not guilty. Now with that verdict on the past, the future looks hopeful, doesn't it? Will he not graciously give us all things? Elders who accept Jesus' forgiveness may learn to echo Paul. Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surprising greatness of knowing Christ Jesus. My Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. That's Philippians 3, 7 through 9. What if for one day Jesus were to become you? What if for 24 hours Jesus wakes up in your bed, walks in your shoes, lives in your house, assumes your schedule? Your boss becomes his boss. Your mother becomes his mother. Your pains becomes his pains. With one exception, nothing about your life changes. Your health doesn't change. Your circumstances don't change. Your schedule isn't altered. Your problems aren't solved. Only one change occurs. What if for one day and one night... Jesus lives your life with his heart. Your heart gets the day off and your life is led by the heart of Christ. His priorities governs your actions. His passions drives your decisions. His love directs your behavior. What would you be like? Would people notice a change? Your family, would they see something new? Your co-workers, would they sense a difference? What about the less fortunate? Would you treat them the same? And your friends, would they detect more joy in you? How about your enemies? Would they receive more mercy from Christ's heart than yours? And you, how would you feel? What alterations would this transplant have on your stress level? What alterations would this transplant have on your mood swings? What alterations would this transplant have on your temper? Would you sleep better? Would you see sunsets differently? Would you see death differently? Would you see taxes differently? Any chances or any chance you need fewer aspirins or sedatives? How about your reaction to traffic delays? Would you still dread what you are dreading? Better yet, would you still do what you are doing? Would you still do what you had planned for the next 24 hours? Pause and think about your schedule for a minute, obligations, engagements, outlines, outings, appointments. With Jesus taking over your heart, would anything change? Let's keep working on this for a moment. Think about it. Listen. Adjust your lens of imagination until you have a clear picture of Jesus leading your life. Then snap the shutter and frame the image. What you see is what God wants. Philippians 2.5 says he wants you to think and act like Christ Jesus. God's plan for you is nothing short 
of a new heart. If you were a car, God would want control of your engine. If you were a computer, God would claim the software and the hard drive. If you were an airplane, God would take his seat in the cockpit. See? But you are a person, so God wants to change your heart. But you were taught to be made new in your hearts, to become a new person. That new person is made to be like God, made to be truly good and holy. Ephesians 4, 23, 24 tells us. God wants you to be just like Jesus. He wants you to have a heart like his. I'm going to risk something here. It's dangerous to sum up grand truths in one statement, but I'm going to try. If a sentence or two could capture God's desire for each of us, it might read like this. Help me, Holy Spirit. God loves you just the way you are, but he refuses to leave you that way. See, he wants you to be just like Jesus. Jesus is our example. God's love. God loves you just the way you are. If you think his love for you would be stronger if your faith were, you are wrong. If you think his love would be deeper if your thoughts were wrong again, don't confuse God's love with the love of people. The love of people often increases with performance and decreases with mistakes. That's not so with God's love. See, he loves you right where you are. Listen, God's love never ceases, never. Though we spurn him, though we ignore him, though we reject him, though we despise him, sometimes we disobey him, we disrespect him, he will not change. Our evil cannot diminish God's love. Our goodness cannot increase it. Our faith does not earn it any more than our stupidity jeopardizes it. God does not love us less if we fail or more if we succeed. God's love never ceases. God loves you just the way you are, but he refuses to leave you that way. When my son was a toddler, I used to take him to a park not far from the house. One day as he was playing in the sandbox, an ice cream salesman approached us. I purchased him a treat, and when I turned to give it to him, I saw that his mouth was full of sand. Where I had intended to put a delicacy, he had put dirt. Did I love him with dirt in his mouth? Absolutely. Was he any less my son with dirt in his mouth? Of course not. Was I going to allow him to keep the dirt in his mouth? No way. See, I loved him right where he was, but I refused to leave him that way. I carried him over to the water fountain and washed out his mouth. Why? Because I love him. God does the same for us. He holds us under the water fountain. He urges us to spit out the dirt. Son, I've got something better for you. I've got a delicacy for you. And so he cleanses us of filth, immorality, dishonesty, prejudice, bitterness, greed. We don't enjoy the cleansing. Sometimes we even prefer the dirt over the ice cream. I can eat dirt if I want to, we pout and proclaim. Which is true, we can, but if we do, the loss is ours. God has a better offer. He wants us to be just like Jesus. Isn't that good news? You aren't stuck with today's personality, see? You aren't condemned to grumpydom. You are tweakable. Even if you worried each day of your life, you needn't worry the rest of your life. So what if you were born a bigot? You don't have to die one. 
Where did you get the idea we can't change? You didn't get it from God. From whence come statements such as, it's just my nature to worry, or I'll always be pessimistic, I'm just that way, or I have a bad temper, I can't help the way I react. Who says, let me ask you, listen, who says, oh, would we make similar statements about our bodies? It's just my nature to have a broken leg. I can't do anything about it, of course not. It's our body's malfunction. We seek help. Shouldn't we do the same with our hearts? If our bodies malfunction, we go to the doctor. If our hearts malfunction, we should go to the master physician. Shouldn't we? Shouldn't we seek aid for our sour attitudes? Can't we request, request treatment for our selfish tirades or our temperaments? Of course we can. Jesus can change our hearts. See, he wants us to have a heart like his. Can you imagine a better offer? Can you? Let me just remind you who our Savior is. The heart of Jesus was and is pure. Our Savior was and is adorned by thousands, yet he was content to live a simple life. He was cared for by women. Let's read Luke 8, 1 through 3. And it came about soon afterwards that he began going about from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chazah, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who were contributing to their, to, to their support out of their private means. Yet Jesus was never accused of lustful thoughts. He was scorned by his own creation, but willing to forgive them before they even requested his mercy. Peter, who traveled with Jesus for three and a half years, described him as a lamb unblemished and spotless. That's 1 Peter 1, 19. After spending the same amount of time with Jesus, John concluded, and in him is no sin, 1 John 3, 5. Jesus' heart was peaceful. The disciples fretted over the need to feed the thousands, but not Jesus. He thanked God for the problem. The disciples shouted for fear in the storm, but not Jesus. He slept through the storm. Peter drew his sword to fight the soldiers, but not Jesus. He lifted his hand to heal. His heart was at peace, see. When his disciples abandoned him, did he pout and go home? When Peter denied him, did he lose his temper? When the soldier spit in his face, did he breathe fire in theirs? Far from it. Jesus was at peace, see. He forgave them. He refused to be guided by vengeance. He also refused to be guided by anything other than his high call. His heart was purposeful, see. Most lives aim at nothing in particular and achieve it. Jesus aimed at one goal, to save humanity from its sin. He could summarize his life with one sentence, Luke 19.10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus was so focused on his task that he knew when to say, my time has not yet come. That's John 2, 4. Jesus was so focused on his task that he knew when to say, it is finished. That's John 19, 30. But he was not so focused on his goal that he was unpleasant. See, quite the contrary. How pleasant were his thoughts? Children couldn't resist him. 
He could find beauty in lilies. He could find joy in worship. And he could find possibilities in problems. He would spend days with sick people and still feel sorry for them. He spent over three decades of wading through the muck and the mire of our sin, yet still saw enough beauty in us to die for our mistakes. But the crowning attribute of Christ was this. His heart was spiritual. His thoughts reflected his intimate relationship with the Father. I am the Father, and the Father is in me, he stated in John 14, 11. His first recorded sermon begins with the words, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Luke 4, 18. He was led by the Spirit, Matthew 4, 1, and full of the Holy Spirit, Luke 4, 1. He returned from the desert in the power of the Spirit, Luke 4:14. 4, Jesus took his instructions from God. It was his habit to go to worship, Luke 4:16. It was his practice to memorize scripture, Luke 4:4. 4, 4. Luke said Jesus often slipped away to be alone so he could pray, Luke 5:16. His times of prayer guided him. He once returned from prayer and announced it was time to move to another city, Mark 1.38. Another time of prayer resulted in the selection of disciples, Luke 6, 12, and 13. Jesus was led by an unseen hand. The Son does whatever the Father does, John 5.19. In the same chapter, he stated, I can do nothing alone. I judge only the way I am told, John 5.30. The heart of Jesus was spiritual, see. Our hearts seem so far from his. He is pure, we are greedy. He is peaceful, we are hassled. He is purposeful, we are distracted. He is pleasant, we are cranky. He is spiritual, we are earthbound. The distance between our hearts and his seems so immense. How could we ever hope to have the heart of Jesus? Ready for a surprise? We already do. You already have the heart of Christ. Why are you looking at me in that tone? Would I kid you? Listen, if you are in Christ, you already have the heart of Christ. One of the supreme yet unrealized promises of God is simply this. If you have given your life to Jesus, Jesus has given his self to you. He has made your heart his home. It would be hard to say it more clearer or more precise than Paul does. Galatians 2.20, Christ lives in me. At the risk of repeating myself, let me repeat myself. If you have given your life to Jesus, Jesus has given himself to you. He has moved in and unpacked his bags and is ready to change you into his likeness from one degree of glory to another, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Paul explains it with these words in 1 Corinthians 2, 16. Strange as it seems, we Christians do have within us a portion of the very thoughts and mind of Christ. Strange is the word. Strange is the word. Listen to it again. Strange as it seems, we Christians do have within us a portion of the very thoughts and mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.16 if I have the mind of Christ, why do I still think so much like me? If I have the heart of Christ, why do I still have the hang-ups of Rick? If Jesus dwells within me, why do I still hate traffic jams? Part of the answer is illustrated in a story about a lady who had a small house on the seashore of Ireland at the turn of the century. She was quite wealthy, but also quite frugal or careful in spending. The people were surprised then when she decided to be among the first to have electricity in her home. Several weeks after the, the installation, a meter reader appeared at her door. He asked if her electricity was working well, and she assured him it was. I'm wondering, 
If you can explain something to me then, he said, your meter shows scarcely any usage at all. Are you using your power? Certainly, she said. Each evening when the sun sets, I turn on my lights just long enough to light my candles. Then I turn them off. See, she tapped into the power but doesn't use it. Her house is connected but not altered. Don't we make the same mistake. We too, with our souls saved, but our hearts unchanged, are connected, but not altered. Trusting Christ for salvation, but resisting transformation. In other words, we occasionally flip the switch, but most of the time we settle for shadows. What would happen if we left the light on? What would happen if we were only, if we not only flipped the switch but lived in the light? What changes would occur if we set about the task of dwelling in the radiance of Christ? No doubt about it, God has ambitious plans for us. The same one who saved your soul wants to remake your heart. God's plan is nothing short of a total transformation. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son, Romans 8.29. You have begun to live the new life in which you are being made new and are becoming like the one who made you. This new life brings you the true knowledge of God. Colossians 3.10 Listen, God is willing to change us into the likeness of the Savior. Shall we accept this offer? Here is my suggestion. Let's imagine what it means to be like Jesus. Let's look long into the heart of Christ. Let's spend some time in the Bible considering his compassion, reflecting upon his intimacy with the Father, admiring his focus, pondering his endurance. How did he forgive? When did he pray? What made him so pleasant? Why didn't he give up? Let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Perhaps in seeing him, we will see what we can become. Perhaps in seeing him, we will see what we can become. Just like Jesus. Father, we thank you for the message now. We thank you for the privilege to be able to speak to your people. We thank you for harmonizing the words you've given me with the words pouring out of your heart. Let the listeners have received and digested what was prepared for them today in Jesus' name. If you are not saved, if you have not accepted Jesus' salvation, if you have not been born again, please pray this prayer after me and get it done today in Jesus' name. Father God, I confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of my life. I believe in my heart he died and you raised him from the dead. I confess it and I believe it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, for I want to be just like Jesus.